I didn't, I didn't catch that. I'm going to email it to him so he would put it on the computer for it. So you have Salman slides and... Make sure to get his right side. <laughs> Where's the makeup? This is one of the makeup artists. Allah, well, uh, I know. Yeah, I know it's terrible. Know. The makeup artist, yeah, Allah. The makeup. That, this, that's so professional and it's so flattering at the same time. So I can't make up my mind. I would not be the person. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, okay. We'll give a film. Oh, okay. 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 Sessions. Oh, great. I guess we do I need to do a class sign. Oh, okay. Well, it was for the sacred sound thing, so I did a sacred sound. So I got the answers, but then when we had Ali Abdullah a couple weeks ago, he came with a class, and people were still so And I said, I'm going to do it. I get still, so I went, so I gave it. Nice. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. 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 You just I came in yesterday. Apparently, we came in the same place. The album was very exclusive. Yeah. Well, not the same time. Well, not the same time. We arrived the same time. We're on the bar at the same time. But didn't see each other at all. Yeah. No, we were in San Francisco. We, in San Francisco. we arrived at the airport at the same time we realized we got to Berkeley at the same time. Yeah, so we must have been time. So we just did not see each other. Yeah, I came from the UK. I said, we're just done, but we came from the UK. No, we had like, I had like a two day trip. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm saying we were resting and the rest of the album was arrived with a turn of two. There was some rain one morning, but I wouldn't say it was so heavy. Okay, so yeah. maybe Oh, yeah. Oh, I was at a wake before the conference. Yeah. Yes. There was rain, but it was, maybe it was early in the morning. <laughs> No, not the first time I've not worn a jacket. I don't know. Like, nah, I don't know. Like, 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 like,
manage it because they couldn't find the right age. They called the manager to get to sign up for it. I don't want to hear this. I'm just saying how the last one did. behind you if you want. Thank you. 
should have put a note. Uh, we sent some people to put a note. session and welcoming those who are joining us online uh, for this uh, session. Uh, we have uh, two speakers uh, with us for this evening. Uh, both actually we were just uh, last weekend in Istanbul so we were both three of us were presenting in the conference in Istanbul so so long no see right so we've been lecturing about Islamophobia on the plane. <laughs> bring in the TSA interest uh, in the subject matter. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Salman Sayyid. Uh, he's the chair, uh, holds a chair in uh, social history and decolonial thought at the University of Leeds. Uh, he's been engaged in the subject of Islamophobia for a long period of time, uh, having published uh, a book, uh, Thinking, Through Islam Thinking Through Islamophobia, which we have in the exhibit. So if you go to the ethnic studies exhibit, his material is there. But critically as well, uh, Salman is the editor of the Reorient Journal. Uh, we see the Reorient Journal as a partner journal for the Islamophobia Studies Journal. Uh, so both actually engage in the subject of Islamophobia, decolonial thought, critical Muslim studies. And both journals are published through Pluto Press in a partnership. Uh, so again, uh, you submit some of your papers to the Islamophobia Studies Journal, but also you could submit to Reorient. And I'm thankful because he brought us the hard copies that would go into the Ethnic Studies uh, Library. Knowledge production is very important, right? Uh, because uh, you could read somebody's writing and complain about it, but when you write, then they have to complain about it. <laughs> right? So we insist on actually writing and contributing, and so people can continue to actually uh, uh, complain and possibly write responses. Also, his book, A Fundamental Fear, Eurocentrism and the Emergence of Islamism. Uh, this is an important book that uh, uh, Salman Sayyid has published, and likewise, it's available uh, it will be available in uh, the Ethnic Studies Library. And if any one of you have also a book that you want us to include in the collection, by all means, uh, please send it us. We're constituting a collection in the Ethnic Studies Library. So I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Salman Sayyid to the podium, The Geopolitics of Islamophobia. Please help me welcome. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm very, I was going to say I'm very pleased to be here at the 10th conference on Islamophobia. And it's a great achievement to Hatem and many of their colleagues here who've been organizing this. But actually I'm not that pleased either because it means to say that Islamophobia still exists with us. Ten years ago, um, I think everyone in this room would have been quite happy if we had said, right, this is the first and only conference because after this we would have solved Islamophobia and it would be of historical interest. But here we are talking about Islamophobia and we've been talking about it for 10 years. So I'm going to contribute to carrying on talking about Islamophobia because it just doesn't seem to go away. Uh, um, despite the fact that many people think that it isn't really real, um, it just carries on. Now, I have a confession to make that um, Hatham already mentioned this. I read um, 
somewhere that before television, being a comedian was fairly straightforward. You had material and that was it. You never needed to change your material because you could do the same jokes all the time because you know, you've got maybe 500, 1,000 people coming to see you and they really would come to see you again and again. And therefore, you, every time they came to see you, you got the laughs because people thought you were doing fresh material, etc., etc. And then television happened and comedians realized that once you go and do a ch joke on television, you need new material because everyone's heard that joke now and it's not funny. Now, similarly, um, with the internet, talks which you could have carried on churning out again and again, you realize a lot of people have heard of them and have seen them and therefore you feel compelled to say, well, actually, this is slightly different. Um, the way I get around this is basically saying that this is part of a kind of a tour uh, where I'm trying to refine these sets of arguments. So the arguments that I'm going to be talking about around is geopolitics and Islamophobia is something that I'm kind of working on um, and I'm hoping that it will refine itself. So the kind of feedback and things you get are really helpful in trying to realize um, what you want to say and how you're saying it. So that's the kind of preamble. What I'm going to talk about then is really three things today. I'm going to talk about geopolitics as a the highest form of politics. And I don't mean that in a moral judgment sense, but I mean geopolitics is normally considered to be, um, it's mainly considered to be the sort of thing that serious people do. It's not really about feelings, it's not really about culture, it's supposed to be about things to do with state power, it's to do with the international order, it's kind of things which are supposed to be really, really um, hard and serious. And it's odd to talk about Islamophobia in terms of um, geopolitics, because Islamophobia, like racism in general, is considered to be really a matter that is domestic. It's, um, the study of racism has always been considered mainly to be something to do with the management of ethnically marked populations in countries. It's not supposed to have any international significance. Um, it's a sort of thing that really lends itself to local governance. It's to do with localities rather than something which is local. So to talking about geopolitics of Islamophobia already shifts that focus and interrupts the normal paradigm of understanding racism and racism studies as a matter of the interior, a matter of locality. Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'm going to try and talk a little bit about around this is really some of the challenges that Islamophobia presents, both epistemologically, but also in terms of um, a different kind of politics a different way of understanding how the world is. And the final thing that I'm going to try and talk about is really a kind of a, um, an approach to understanding Islamophobia which brings together some of these things that I've mentioned before and breaks away from the paradigm of Islamophobia to be simply contained within the form of racism studies, okay? So that's the kind of general arc <coughs> Um, I don't know if I'll get there, but that's what I'm trying to do. Okay. All right. So let me start with the geopolitics first. Now, geopolitics and Islamophobia would be a oxymoron, as I've tried to allude to you already. Partly because geopolitics, when people talk about it, it always lends itself to be some kind of elaborate game-like thing. Um, you have the idea of chess, for example. The cover of uh, many books on geopolitics, including by Zygmunt Brzezinski, have a chess board. The title of the book is the you know, a game of chess, etc. Or the idea that people often talk about geopolitics is like some sort of risk a board, in a board game where you have fixed pieces, fixed board, fixed rules, and the whole idea is that you move 
these pieces in a particular way to produce outcomes. And in fact, the majority of conversations, both expert and popular and journalistic about geopolitics, never leaves these kinds of metaphors. Um, it comes during the Cold War, it was about counting tanks, and nowadays you can simply see similar kinds of logic, that you're counting up the pieces and you're believing that the board that everything gets played on is more or less fixed, and the pieces are fixed, particular scale. So the map that you may, may not be able to see on the board there is produced by a British, um, one of the early pioneers of geopolitics called Mackinder, and just basically says that all of history, human history, is really about the tensions between controlling what he calls the pivot area and the areas around which are the kind of the crescent or the rimland, etc. And it's the tension between those two areas which tell you what, how history develops. So this pivot area at that time um, and subsequently was occupied by the Russian Empire. And basically the idea was that whoever controlled the pivot area would control your, that Eastern Hemisphere and that was too powerful for anything. So American foreign policy since 1945 uh, but earlier than that, has really been geared to making sure that no one can control the pivot, this pivot area. Yeah? And there are different kinds of combinations. This could have been Germany conquering Russia, or China and Russia coming together, etc., etc. Now, this, in a way, this map and the variations on that have guided foreign policy of the United States and Britain and others for at least 50, if not 100 years. Because it's always, if you think about, if you were able to superimpose American bases on that map, you would see that they're all around this sort of pivot area. There's a kind of crescent around that, yeah? Um, if you were able to look at the kind of speeches and kind of uh, strategies of, to deal with all of these things, you will see the similar logic is to basically to contain and make sure this pivot does not conquer and transform those, um, the, the world in a sense. Now, what does this have to do with Islamophobia? Well, it depends what you mean by Islamophobia. If you treat Islamophobia as a form of ideology or as a set of ideas or beliefs, then very little. Because what was interesting about the geopolitical approach is that it makes no concessions whatsoever for the content of uh, things like ideology, etc. It doesn't matter whether it was the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union which occupied the pivot area. It doesn't matter whether it's China or Germany which occupy the pivot area. And in McIntyre's own kind of um, essay, um, written in 1918, I think, 1916, I can't remember, um, he basically goes through the history of looking at different kinds of uh, states and political formations which occupied this area, um, the Mongols, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here, the real thrust of history comes from geography, and it doesn't matter what the content is. In which case, Islamophobia, as long as you treat Islamophobia as an epiphenomenal, as something secondary, as simply a set of ideas and values and prejudices, etc., it wouldn't have a geopolitics as such because 
it doesn't do anything. It's simply geography is the key to understanding historical forces. Okay. Now, clearly what's missing from here, this account is the whole notion of fixity. It's not just geographically determined, it's actually to do with fixity. To make this point, I want to take an extract from a poem by Borges, um, an Argentinian writer, called Chess. And in this, as you can see, he puts, asks the uh, question that the pieces, the chess pieces, don't know it's the player's hand that dominates and guides their destiny. In other words, there's a hidden force which is moving these pieces. The pieces themselves are no longer simply um, autonomous in any way, they're already being shaped. And in that notion, he goes on to ask that, you know, you could say for them, the pieces in chess may be moved by God, but then what is the God behind God that moves God? And that in itself becomes quite an interesting kind of parallel there. Because what he's pointing to, I would say to you, is the notion precisely which goes against the very idea of the um, board with fixed number of pieces, with a fixed kind of um, space, as being the engine of history. Because the whole point about history is that everything changes, or everything can change, including the boards and chess. Yeah? Now, if you do that, then you get to an idea that uh, what you're dealing with is really the impossibility of continuities. This kind of long durée and the idea of the pivot area, the idea of a geopolitics which is fixed in the geography takes for granted that the geography of the earth is actually something which is natural. Now, many of you, well, I say many of you, I hope a few of you, may feel, well, this is obvious. Of course it's natural because the earth is what it is and the division of the continents is what it is. But think about this. If I was to ask you, people in this room, which continent do they feel that they have a heritage from? All of you would be able to identify those continents. Well, I hope so, anyway. But these continents did not exist transhistorically. So let me give you two ex quick examples. The continent of Asia, and everyone in this room can put up their hands and say they come from the continent of Asia. But if you look at the history of the continent of Asia, there are three main areas where um, complex writing appeared very um, for a very long time. Um, around the um, Euphrates and Tigris, around the Indus and the Ganges, around the Yellow River um, in, in China. Now, in all of these, we have records which go back, in some cases, almost 5,000 years in others at least 4,000 years. And you don't find in those records any sense of them belonging to a common Asian um, identity. It's not that people in China and India and what we now, for want of a better world, called Middle East, think of themselves as all three of them having a common historical destiny or they don't say we Asians. Why not? The idea of Asia as we understand it only appears after we decide that Europe is a continent and then Europe draws the maps which label Asia, Africa, America. And that cartography you can say is simply, oh well, it's no big thing, you could call it anything you like, but actually it is quite a big thing because it is the one that becomes so naturalized. And we just think that these continental land masses have always existed in the shape and form they have, and from that we can read certain things. But what we actually find is that they themselves, the geography that we experience, is actually a product of cartography, 
rather than something that you experience naturally. Now, saying all of that suggests here in which Islamophobia may not be considered to be simply something that floats on the top of land masses. Islamophobia may not just be epiphenomenal, it may in fact become conscious. What is Islamophobia? Or try to say that. And the two parts to this, to, the, there is no one definition of Islamophobia and nor is it necessary to have one. But what may be useful type of racism is to understand that Islamophobia is not just prejudice. It's not just an ideology. It is a form of government. It's a form of governance, which means it's a form of managing people. Now, when you put it like that, occurs, and here's a list of many different places, and we could play around with that list, and we could say, well, why are some countries there and others are not? But in a sense, what you're seeing with this uh, list or the list like that is that appearing in different places where you are trying to manage populations is involved in the acts of governance itself. It is about governmentality and, and, and racism is a form of governmentality. It's about how the modern contemporary state deals with the idea of people. I don't know about you, but some of my colleagues at university often say to me that the university is at its best when there are no students there because they're not getting in your way, they're not going to coffee shops, etc. and the university functions perfectly without them. And this may be something, and you can imagine, for governments, they have a similar kind of feel, pop, feel towards the people. They just get in the way. They make things awkward, they mess up your nice filing classification system, and countries would be great if you had all of this, but without the awkwardness of having to deal with people. As John Paul Sartre said, you know, hell is other people. So you can see there's a common kind of theme there. But the real issue is about the management of populations. And the racial state and the modern state, not do they only just share a um, common beginning, but they have a common DNA. And that DNA is about regulating people in particular ways and forms. And then Islamophobia is simply another way of regulating all of that. Yeah? Okay, so to show this, I wanted to fix upon why the change from Islamophobia, why does Islamophobia come into being? In all of these kinds of... Um, I was getting nervous because Hatham was writing and I thought I was running out of time, but I've got 10 minutes, so... <laughs> okay, so, in many ways, around the world, when you see Islamophobia, you will see the figure of the Muslim, which is not the same as an actual real Muslim that you can touch and talk to, etc. Don't touch them, but it's just talk to, etc., right? But a representation of a Muslim. And if you rem may have heard that the killer at Christchurch wrote how Muslims were invaders. Uh, the idea of the Muslim as a permanent immigrant. Muslims are considered to be immigrants even in countries which grew up around the Muslims. So for example, in Russia, or India or Thailand, the Muslim population was there before the modern state was there, but they're still considered to be immigrants. The idea of being disloyal, dual loyalty, the idea of violence, misogyny. One of the good things about uh, Muslims is that they can become an excuse for patriarchy, because however bad patriarchical you may be, however misogynist you may be, you can always point to Muslims as being more misogynist, so it kind of lowers the threshold of what is permissible. We're not bad as Muslims at will in that sense. So in a sense the descriptions of 
Muslims, the figure of the Muslim, have a commonality which circulates globally. It structures different kinds of positions. It has certain channels of flow in which it conditions what kind of governance is possible. So to refer very quickly, um, the idea of the terrorist means that you have the evacuation of the notion of freedom fighter. The uh, of, uh, armed liberation struggle becomes impossible for Muslims, but on the back of that it becomes impossible for anyone else. So all issues in which Muslims are uh, facing uh, repression and they find that there is no political means of redress, they cannot exercise even armed defense because that becomes a sign of their being terrorist. Um, the idea that extremist, it doesn't matter what they say or what they do, the figure of the Muslim is always going to be extreme by their definition. And some of this, of course, becomes very comical when you look at the um, outright kind of preachers and things that they write about and, or whatever. And, uh, but there is this sense that these common descriptions are not just simply words or phrases. They actually implicate transformations in practices. All of these are changes in practices. So when you think that every Muslim is potentially a terrorist, it changes your practice in terms of uh, surveillance, in terms of um, citizenship rights, in terms of internment. All of these things become changed because you start off with the assumption that to be a Muslim is to be susceptible to terrorism, for example. Yeah? So, what I would like to say is that we should think about the way that Islamic, Islamophobia is expressed, the way that it is uh, articulated, should be seen not as just labels, and that's why I think a lot of the um, focus on media representation misses the point. It's not that Muslims are mislabeled and that's somehow hurtful. The idea is that labels, they're not really labels, they're prompts and cues. They invoke particular kinds of actions and responses. It's not the labeling that's a problem, it's what, the sub, what that happens when you describe someone or something as extremist, violent, misogynist, terroristic, etc., etc. Yeah? It changes practices, and it changes state practices. The biggest source of Islamophobia in the world is the state. Not because the state is particularly evil, it may or may not be that, it's simply that has the greatest capacity for making these prompts and cues into practices which are institutionalized. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a transnational um, groupings or assemblies or uh, assemblages or um, industries which play on circulating some of these things, but it's to recognize that the state often is the one that can transform people's experiences most quickly. Now, to understand the meaning of what a figure of a Muslim should be, it depends on the context, and the context is, depends on culture, and culture ultimately is produced by the political. So that's the kind of steps that I would take into this. What that means is what we have to understand, if we want to understand Islamophobia, is not so much the misrepresentation of Muslims, but how the figure of the Muslim becomes constitutive of the world order itself. 
What I'm going to suggest to you is this. Believe it or not, but we are, the war on terror is now almost half as long as the Cold War. It's hard to imagine, because it seems like it was just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be careful what I have to say. I don't want to say anything about being something or anything, but it doesn't seem like it was just yesterday. But the war on terror has become the grammar of the international order. It doesn't dictate the content of what people say, but it does dictate what can be said and be un understood. That's what a grammar does. A grammar doesn't tell you how to what you say or what it means, but it does tell you what propositions you can put together, what things can be put together in a sentence, what things can be put together to make sense. So in a sense, the grammar of Islamophobia, Islamophobia is the grammar of the war on terror. And the war on terror <coughs> structures the world order. In which case, the idea of a geopolitics and Islamophobia cannot be simply the one where the board, the earth, is the static, uh, <coughs> where fixed pieces move. It is actually a game that moves as you play. And in a sense, what you're seeing is a reconstitution of social identities and social spaces through the evocation of Islamophobia. I'll finish by really focusing on why the Muslim. And I would like to suggest to you that what the figure of the Muslim does is demonstrate the contingency of this world and points to the next world. And if you are of a Muslim faith, you could see the connotations of that. But if you're not, you can still see how the idea of this particular present is contingent and how Muslims remind the world of its contingency. They do this for not any inherent reasons, but simply because of the way in which they are represented as demonstrating this kind of limit. Because in the end, what is common to the um, expression of Islamophobia is how Muslim, the Muslim presence, prevents different countries, different societies from achieving their true destiny. Why cannot be they who they want to be or who they should be is because of the Muslims. In a way, the Muslim is a block on that future. And that's exactly what the Muslim does. How many times have you heard the expression that relates Muslimness to something medieval, something of the Dark Ages. Muslim always points to the past. It is the persistence of the past in the present which prevents the future. And in a sense that Muslims then are the ghosts that haunt the present and make impossible the future. So when China carries out and establishes these um, virtual concentration camps, it does so using the lexicon of terrorism, but also that these are backward people. These are backward pro practices, and they block the Chinese future. This idea of the Muslim as being a block on the future, I would say to you, is crucial. And it is the main theme also among white revanchists. Why you see, for example, um, white supremacists only articulating themselves throughout the world through Islamophobia is because what stops white entitlement, what interrupts it, is the presence of the Muslims. Now, they have a very peculiar hist um, relationship to Islam because some, many of the white supremacist groups would advocate a white Sharia in which they kind of want what they imagine that Muslims are in terms of in relations to questions of um, gender relations, um, sexual orientation, all of these things. So it's a curious kind of way of thinking about that. 
So ultimately what I would say to you, what the figure of the Muslim does is really um, demonstrate why this, the future, cannot come into being. And as a result, I would say that to look at Islamophobia only in relation to how Muslim communities may or may not be being treated in local contexts misses the point that why is it that it is about Muslims? In so many different places, it is about Muslims. And because, I would say to you, Muslims name something which is impossible to imagine happening. And that is a future which is going to be a continuation of the last 500, 200 years. And they do this not because of their own will. They do this because in the end, they, be they represent the kind of hauntings that are already contained in that vision. So, finally, and I do mean finally, I would say to you that an examination of the geopolitics of Islamophobia requires us to rethink both geopolitics and Islamophobia, and to understand Islamophobia as being constitutive of the global order rather than just constitutive of local spaces. Thank you. So our second speaker uh, is also a friend, a dear friend and a colleague that uh, worked with us on the space of Islamophobia. Uh, Jasmine Zain is a professor of sociology and the Muslim study option uh, from Wilfrid Lawyer University. Uh, for those who don't know that is, it's not in the United States. It's in Canada, in Toronto. I know sometimes we're geographically challenged. Uh, so just for those to understand. Uh, her publication includes numerous uh, journal articles on Islamic feminism and Muslim women's studies uh, and Muslims and education in, in Canada and the, uh, in the Canadian diaspora. Uh, her books include uh, Canadian Islamic Schools, uh, Unraveling the Politics of Faith, Gender, Knowledge and Identity, uh, published in 2008. Uh, first, the first ethnography of Islamic schoolings in North America, uh, and an edited volume collection, uh, Islam in the Hinterlands, uh, Muslim Cultural Politics in Canada, is 2012, uh, co-edited. Uh, Muslim Women, Transnational Feminism, uh, Feminism and the Ethics of Pedagogy, Contested Imaginaries in Post-9-11 uh, Cultural Practices. Uh, her work is very tremendous. Uh, for anyone that wants to do work on Canada, I would say that Jasmine is the authority on Muslims in Canada as well as in Islamophobia. Uh, and this is very important for people who want to do research because sometimes they just walk down and say there's nobody doing work on Islamophobia and they just uh, don't realize that the field is already uh, very well established and uh, I think the work of Jasmine in terms of Islamophobia is tremendous. Uh, there's a number of people when you want to have information about Islamophobia. Uh, I go to Jasmine for Canada, Mateus in Sweden, uh, we have uh, Muhammad Nawab in uh, Singapore. Uh, so these are individuals that have done the work uh, and continue to publish and really uh, formulate the Islamophobia studies field. So it's really an honor and pleasure to uh, bring Jasmine to speak to us uh, at this conference. Thank you, Hatem, for the very generous introduction. And also would like to thank you for all the work that you've done over these 10 years and more of uh, putting this conference together and bringing together 
all of the scholars, all of the students, and all of the people who are watching too, um, toward a commitment to build an alternative future where, where Islamophobia is not a part of that. So I really want to thank you for all of your efforts. <laughs> So I'm very um, happy and privileged to, to be here today, but also a little bit jet-lagged because as Hatta mentioned, we just got back from Istanbul, so Islamophobia keeps us very busy and tired. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to share some thoughts with you um, around Islamophobia and the security industrial complex. And as we are talking about virtual forms of internment, I think this hopefully will fit in now. Okay, it's a complex choreography between the the slides and my notes and the clicker, so we'll see how it goes. So I just wanted to start off with a quote here from Naomi Klein that I think sets the stage well for this conversation. Um, and I'll just read it. It says, uh, in, a, in just a few years, the homeland security industry, which barely existed before 9-11, has exploded to a size which is now significantly larger than either Hollywood or the music business. Yet what is more striking is how little the security boom is analyzed and discussed as an economy as an unprecedented convergence of unchecked police powers and unchecked capitalism, a merger of the shopping mall and the secret prison. When information about who is or who is not a security threat is a product to be sold as readily as information uh, about who buys Harry Potter books on Amazon or who's taken a Caribbean cruise and might enjoy one in Alaska, it changes the values of a culture. Not only does it create an incentive to spy, torture, and generate false information, but it creates a powerful impetus to perpetuate the sense of peril that created the industry in the first place. So I think there's a lot in that that I think will speak to some of what I hope to unpack a little bit in talking about this um, uh, Islamophobia and the security industrial complex. So in this new world order, the military and security communities, along with academics and the media, function within a security industrial complex to create new ontological categories through which Muslims can be profiled, studied, policed, disciplined, and detained. And so this is a kind of constellation as well as a nexus. The idea of a security industrial complex describes how the boundaries between internal and external security, uh, policing, and military operations have been eroded. The process has been accelerated by the development of new technologies for the surveillance of public and private places, of communication and of groups or individuals, a trend that's been accelerated by the war on terror. So now these technologies include a myriad of uh, local and global surveillance systems, the introduction of biometric identifiers, electronic tagging and satellite monitoring, paramilitary equipment, for the public order and crisis management and the militarization of border uh, controls. Military organizations dominate research and development in these areas under the banner of security research. But that's also extended to the role of embedded academics or those who, academics who are also doing research that supports the goals of a lot of these security industries. And that's something I've spoken about and written about before, but I'm not gonna go into now, but just to get a sense of the breadth of uh, players involved in the security industrial uh, complex. And so trying to think through a way to understand this constellation of forces, I was reminded of uh, uh, Foucault's work on the carceral archipelago, which he talks about prison-like institutions, but also including uh, quote, charitable societies, moral improvement associations, organizations that handed out assistance and also practice surveillance, workers' estates and lodging houses, all which functioned as disciplinary mechanisms with all two visible marks of the penitentiary system. So this view of society as a carceral archipelago, according to Foucault, means that, quote, we now uh, live in a world in which we're constantly being watched judged, disciplined, evaluated, and controlled by different experts who write reports about us. Foucault writes that the judges of normality are everywhere. He goes on to explain that the carceral network in its compact or disseminated forms with the systems of insertion, distribution, surveillance, observation has been the greatest support in modern society of the normalizing power. <coughs> 
So I would argue that the, the biopolitics of governmentality that constitute disciplinary societies includes a set of precarceral measures and conditions. And I'm trying to think through this as a security archipelago, so drawing on his notion to extend it to a security archipelago, and I'm trying to come up with a definition, so this is just a work in progress, the definition that I've put up there. And I would in fact change it from sets to constellations of institutions, technologies, economies, and policies involving both state and non-state actors that both construct and respond to the ideologies of risk and result in specific securitized conditions, identities, habitus, and dispositions, as well as leading to psychological and affective forms of conditioning and response. So very uh, broad and expansive in terms of the kind of constellations of these disciplinary technologies, but as well as taking into account the effect and affect of those technologies. And these are formed through a nexus of biopolitics and necropolitics which, within, which the, within the context of post 9-11 governmentality, which leads to the power over life, death, and banishment. And so I've thought of some of the issues that can fall underneath that. I'm not going to go into them, but just to mention this idea of border eugenics, how, we are, how governments are sorting out the savage and the civilized at the border. Uh, deciding on those particular uh, uh, categories and who is, uh, and that's a kind of sorting out of people in terms of a eugenicist <coughs> practice, right? In terms of who we see as being uh, uh, desirable versus undesirable uh, foreigners at our gates. And this, of course, relates to racial forms of securitization. So security has become uh, a racialized uh, phenomenon. And of course, the broad expanse of CBE or countering violent extremism programs that operate globally. Uh, we have some people here who are doing work on that. Paula Thompson has done some great work on CBE. Mohammed here is doing some work on CBE as well globally. So this is another area. I'm not going to get too into all of those, but there's some great people doing work on these areas. Also, this idea of how does this play out outside of the West or the five eyes in Western nations. Uh, Paula Marr's book that looks at neoliberalism and the security archipelago in the global south and so looking at how those formations take place through the kinds of social movements that evolved and he's looked at uh, Egypt and, um, and Latin America as uh, case studies. But also we see it taking place in places in uh, Burma with the Rohingyas and the securitization there and also in the camps in Bangladesh uh, where there's heavy securitization. Uh, and China with the Uyghurs of course is another example. Um, think of those guests that have been placed in the homes of we Chinese Uyghurs by the state to monitor them within the intimate domestic spaces to uh, monitor and report on their behavior and it's uh, you know whether it is uh, too Islamic and therefore too much of a threat uh, and so imagine that having people placed in your home to monitor all of your moves and the most intimate kinds of en uh, encounters and exchanges that you have within the privacy of your own domicile. And so this relates to the making of a panoptic society. I'm just going to use some examples um, from the US in this case uh, that kind of exemplify the making of a panoptic society. And I'm drawing on a report by the ACLU that documented the sur surveillance industrial complex and how the American government is conscripting business and individuals into the construction of a surveillance uh, society. Uh, they had a program called Eagle Eyes, and it's a program that was billed as an anti-terrorism initiative that enlists the eyes and ears of Air Force members and citizens in the war on terror. For example, having a telephone tip line where you can you know, talk about whether you think your neighbors might be involved in terrorist activity. Um, anyone in, can uh, recognize elements of potential terror planning when they see it. Uh, boast the website of this program. So again, now transforming citizens into, uh, into sur uh, surveilling other citizens and into the process of a form of racial and religious profiling. Um, in the website, they also talk about things to include that you should watch for, people who don't seem to belong. In the workplace, in the neighborhood, in business establishments, or anywhere else, if a person just doesn't seem like he or she belongs, there's probably a reason for that. 
and we can see how much can get read into that category of belonging or non-belonging and who do we see as part of the imagined community of the nation as Bennett Anderson would have put it and who do we see as being needed to be exiled or banished from it. And so the report um, that I was speaking about, the ACLU talked about, that you know, in public appeals, they're not based on crimes that have already been committed, but on the prospect or suspicion that an individual might be planning something bad. Again, this idea of pre-crime. Um, many suspicious behaviors that were cited by authorities had no rational or proven relation to terrorism. Um, and the tip centers that were set up were already attracting malicious tips from individuals who were turning in neighbors that they didn't like, um, tips about strangers engaged in, quote, un-American activity, and of course many reports based on racial profiling. So you can imagine the gamut of what is opened up when you create these tip lines and abilities for people to, um, you know, talk about who they think could be a potential threat. Uh, it re they reported that they got calls from people who they've thought uh, looked Middle Eastern that were in a library or on the computer somewhere. Uh, again, bodies out of place where they shouldn't be uh, were, or seen to be out of place were coded as dangers and threats. So in this slide, Canada had a similar proposition. Again, this is sort of moving us away from Canadian exceptionalism where we think Canada is this bastion of multiculturalism and we have, you know, uh, are welcoming all of the refugees and fellow Canadian in the back. Um, who knows that a lot of that is a, is a smoke screen, that multiculturalism, of course, is actually um, hiding and masquerading a lot of inequality and a lot of very Islamophobic policies of the state. Um, this one was a, a barbaric cultural practices tip line. Now, what we do actually have a barbaric cultural practices act in Canada that refers to things like FG, uh, female genital mutil mutilation, forced marriages, and so on. And you know, all of the way that that was coded was very much around practices that they tried to falsely connect to uh, Muslim practices. Um, and so there was a suggestion by a, um, a government official, Kelly Leach, uh, who was a conservative member of parliament that wanted to have a tip line where related to the Barbaric Cultural Practices Act. So if you witnessed barbaric cultural practices, however you want that to be construed, of your you know, neighbors or friends that you could call those in. Uh, fortunately, that, that tip line did not go through. However, the Barbaric Cultural Practices Act still does exist. Um, so again, a little bit about countering violent extremism. I'm just going to give one example um, a, from the PREVENT program in uh, Britain. And that is a voluntary program, aims to divert people from terrorism before they offend. Uh, public bodies such as schools and universities have a duty to report those that they suspect are at risk of being radicalized. So consider what that means and what are the markers, because there's never really a clear definition of what it means to be a radical. That used to have a very positive meaning at one time. Now we see it very much coded around forms of perceived forms of Muslim uh, degeneracy and um, and violence. Uh, but you know, again, how is that being coded? And now we're seeing it being implemented in preschool. So the criminalization of childhood, right? So now uh, those who work in preschool have a, prevent, a duty, according to the PREVENT policy, to create and enforce a clear and rigorous expectation to promote fundamental British values within education as part of their strategy to overcome radicalization and terrorism. So the inculcation of nativist uh, kinds of values is seen as a way to rehabilitate uh, degeneracy, Muslim degeneracy, for example. Um, and so the Counterterrorism and Security Act of 2015 places a prevent duty on early year settings, right? So preschool, to have, uh, to, ha to have due regard to the need to prevent people from becoming drawn into terrorism, because apparently that starts when you're in diapers and, uh, you know, playing in the sandbox. And so um, there's a number of articles related to that, for example, that staff should be able to identify children who may be vulnerable to radicalization and know what to do when they are identified. Now that sounds really ominous when we're thinking of preschool and we're thinking of young children. So think about how these labels are already being mapped on to the bodies of such young people. Um, they assess the risk of children being brought into terrorism and work in partnership with local partners such as the police, prevent coordinators, 
uh, and so on to take account of local risks and respond appropriately. So very early on, we have this perception of risk as being somehow endemic and being somehow inculcated and almost as if you are born into uh, a predisposition to becoming radicalized so that it should be something that you can identify at a preschool age. To me, this is very, very frightening. Um, think also about Austria and its ban, a proposed ban by uh, uh, Sebastian Kurtz um, to implement a ban on Muslim kindergartens, right? Um, and, and not to have Muslim kindergartens taking place, again, as these sort of hotbeds of extremism that we're now seeing in the sandbox. Uh, and now they're trying to implement bans on hijabs in schools there as well. So again, this sort of uh, pre-crime is starting at a very, very early age and is very disturbing. Uh, universities also, so it isn't just about starting from preschool, but also in higher education. Uh, and there's a lot of the uh, prevent officers were also, um, uh, you know, infiltrating events about Islamophobia. Um, and the National Union of Student Activists told researchers that students felt that they were being spied on um, when a prevent officer demanded a list of names associated with the university's um, Islamic uh, student society. This is something that we're seeing in many, many other uh, parts of the world, and I'll come back to that as well. So we're seeing the kinds of surveillance that are taking place uh, in different, uh, different ages and different uh, contexts. CVE in Canada is fairly new, actually, and we do have an office of... Um, community engagement for the prevention of violence and counter radicalization. Uh, there's a lot of money that's been put into this uh, fairly recently. Uh, the focus up until lately tended to focus on returning foreign fighters that were uh, Muslim going to fight abroad and coming back. Um, the focus is now slowly starting to shift onto white supremacists and white nationalists given the Quebec massacre uh, and also uh, New Zealand. So we are starting to see a little bit of shift there. Um, but the focus, you know, has been predominantly on uh, surveilling Muslims. And what's interesting to me, and I think problematic as well, is the way in which the term resiliency uh, within these kinds of CVE uh, programs has become a new code for how some communities are seen as predisposed to violence and racial and religious degeneracy and need to cultivate resiliency against those forces that are endemic in their communities. So it's really the term resiliency has been co-opted in this way and used and leveraged within these policies in, in a way that's very problematic. And so we're seeing a discursive apparatus that surrounds um, CBE and the construction of the radical. And this also creates a sense um, for those communities under siege who are being surveilled as a kind of embodied carcerality and under siege has become an ontological um, state. So when we talk about embodied carcerality, um, Foucault reminds us that the delinquent is an institutional product. And we see this through Muslims as being positioned as the fifth column. The radical, the terrorist, the extremist, and the jihadist are the new ontologies that are ascribed to Muslims that constitute them as violent, degenerate fanatics hell-bent on the destruction of the West. And these archetypes leave little room for Muslims to locate themselves outside of these narrow and um, reductive topologies. These categories are pervade without reference to the history and complex geopolitical struggles that shape these terms and without acknowledging the role of US foreign policies and the war on terror in creating the condition for reactive, reactionary ideologies to give rise to violent movements. Nonetheless, these new taxonomies of difference tell us who are to be watched, punished, and exiled for fear that they may disrupt our freedom, our values, and our nation. The boundaries of belonging and citizenship and those separating the desirable from undesirable immigrants are anchored in those distinctions. Nationhood, citizenship, civil and human rights hang in the delicate balance between fear and moral panic generated among good citizens toward what I've called the Muslim anti-citizen. So closing the degree of separation between the citizen and outsider is more than just a social or discursive shift. It's a political, legal, and ontological move. It severs the right to have rights as a seemingly inalienable part of the citizenship franchise and constitutes new states of being outside the realm of the normative conditions of the rule of law 
creating a state of exception. And so here, talking about the state of exception becomes central and drawing on Giorgio Gambin, who was of course drawing on Carl Schmitt, and talking about uh, the voluntary creation of a state of emergency that has become one of the essential practices of statecraft. And the state of exception has now become a dominant paradigm of government in contemporary politics. So not just measures that were brought in for specific uh, types of emergency and crisis, but these have become the dominant practices of statecraft now. Um, he argues that the uh, transformation of a provisional exceptional measure into a technique of government leads through a threshold of indeterminacy between democracy and absolutism. So the state of exception has now become the norm, and we can think about the hallmarks of the state of exceptionalism when we look at things like practices of extraordinary rendition, and this happens in Canada as well as the United States. Uh, in Canada, we have the use of security certificates against non-citizens, so if you're a non-citizen but you are, uh, again, in a pre-crime sense, uh, perceived to have uh, be a threat to the nation, you can be detained indefinitely based on secret evidence with secret trials held against you. Uh, we've had five Muslim men, famously now dubbed the Secret Trial Five, who have been held since 2000 on the basis of security certificates and don't know why they're being held. And of course, there's so this dismantles the rights of non-citizens, and of course, there's no-fly lists and other kinds of examples of that that operate within that. There are also, within the state of exception, political categories that are being remapped with new cartographies of meaning. And I want to talk about uh, Omar Khadr, who was a Canadian uh, youth who was detained in Guantanamo for over a decade. He was incarcerated at the age of 15 after being uh, uh, taken uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan after a raid there and accused of killing an American uh, medic. Now, despite his age, he was not treated as a child soldier and repatriated, which should have been the norm under international law, but he was rather labeled an, uh, an enemy combatant and incarcerated. And so that becomes possible through this state of exception where uh, the rules of law become suspended. And so the radical is one that needs to be contained, a quintessential uh, carceral subject, or as Agamben also talked about, homo sacer, and reduced to this notion of bare life. According to the American uh, critical theorist Henry Giroux, he says, quote, under such circumstances when the state increasingly rules with a state of emergency, justified on an alleged all-out attack on terrorism, laws are suspended, democracy is slowly liquidated, and the brute power of authoritarianism descends over every aspect of public life. And so this is what we are clearly seeing. Okay, I think I'm gonna just go ahead a bit. Um, as we talk about surveillance, uh, Muslim youth is another area of my research. I've been looking at the 9-11 generation of Muslim youth in Canada and how Islamophobia and the war on terror has affected them in terms of their sense of identity, citizenship and belonging. But I also looked at this question around radicalization and security and I have a chapter on that uh, as well. And one of the things I kept hearing about was how they're being surveilled in universities. And so we see this happening, of course, in New York. There was a famous case um, where the NYPD had been monitoring Muslim uh, communities. They'd been going into mosques. They'd been going into um, other community sites. They were also going into universities as well. Um, they went on trips. Um, undercover agents went on like white water rafting trips uh, with the MSAs and recorded students' names and kept that in intelligence files and information on things like how often they prayed. Um, and so we're starting to see this uh, more and more in Canada as well. Um, you know, the student association at my university, uh, they were also contacted by CSIS, which is our uh, security and intelligence service. Um, my son was the president of the Muslim Student Association and he was elected president one evening. And they didn't even announce to the membership that he was the new president. But next day, first thing in the morning on his cell phone, he got a call from CSIS, who were asking him for an interview because he was the new president of the MSA. Although no one else knew, aside from the executive, that he'd been elected. 
So, you know, coffee with CSIS has now sort of become a thing that we do. And we meet with these agents and actually try and, and talk to them about not just uh, the issues that they're concerned about, which is what's going on in Muslim communities and with the MSA and our people being radicalized, but really, how are you protecting us? And that's how we often turn the tables uh, at these meetings with CSIS. And it also becomes like a joke at Muslim uh, events where you kind of play spot the CSIS agent because you know they're there somewhere, so who is it? It's like, where's Waldo? So that's sort of, uh, you know, something we can joke about, but something that becomes a, a reality as well. And when we talk about surveillance and this panoptic effect, there's also what I call the panopticon of self-surveillance. And this is the way in which, uh, you know, people start to surveil themselves. And so I see this a lot with uh, the youth. So part and parcel of these new security regimes is the control and policing of racial and cultural alterity. In a climate of hyper surveillance by state authorities, um, there's also a process of internalizing the gaze uh, within the Muslim community. And I call that the, the uh, panopticon of self-surveillance. And so some Muslim organizations after 9-11, a group called the Canadian Islamic Congress had posted a better safe than sorry set of tips on their website that you could then look at how you could recognize extremist behavior among youth, such as uh, excessive preoccupation with religious rituals, right? So any form of religiosity can be easily coded into uh, being a threat or being a potential radical. In fact, when I've had coffee with some of these uh, counter-terrorist uh, officers who come to talk to our students, you know, I ask them that question. Well, what, what does it mean to be a radical? What are you looking at? So is it when Fatima here, if she starts to wear a niqab, or is it when Salman grows his beard longer? What are the markers? And they really don't have responses for that, right? They don't have a clear-cut answer to what they're looking for. But I said to them, you know, that actually matters because your definition or your lack of definition affects my kids when they cross the border, it affects our community, and it affects us. So if you don't have a clear definition, it becomes wide open to the array of meanings and, uh, uh, you know, stereotypes that people map onto your body. So that also becomes internalized in the way that a lot of youth, for example, talk about what they're doing. And you can ask the 9-11 generation questions like, you know, how did it affect you? And they'll generally say, oh, it didn't affect me. And I'll say, really? Okay, so what are your student organizations doing? And they'll say, well, you know, we were going to go up north and play paintball, but we didn't do that because we didn't want to be seen as a terrorist cell. <laughs> oh, but 9-11 didn't affect you. Okay. Yeah, we, you know, we used to play violent video games in the concourse of the university, but we don't want people to think that, you know, we're planning an attack somewhere. Like, oh, okay, but 9-11 didn't affect you. Right, so there's always these kinds of things. Even my own son wanted to take the MSA to the up north to do a bonfire, and I was like, "You can't do that." Like brown kids in the woods lighting fires, that's, you, know, you just can't do that. Right, so we become aware and we become self-surveilling. And so, in closing, I'm just going to share with you uh, some of the narratives of the youth that I've been working with and talking to. Um, let me just see. Oh yeah, I like this one. So I'll probably leave you with this, maybe, example. Um, so this is Zabeda, and she's saying, we were going to the US and my baby cousin, he was on the airplane, and he had a book written for children about how to fly a plane. And then we were all scared. We were like, why did we pack this? You know, everyone was scared because you feel this way. You're always on the lookout. Are we going to get judged? I should probably sit more nicely, smile more. People shouldn't be scared of me. I know a family, whenever they're crossing the border or they're flying to the states or coming back, they always shave their beards. And then when they get there, they grow their beards back. But traveling, they always have to shave. And so I'll just leave with that quote because it's again one of those examples of the self-surveillance where you go on or you're on a plane and you're thinking, what do, what do I have that's incriminating? Like what could I be, uh, people could, you know, find that I might have to be deplaned. You know, if I bring a book with me about radicalism that I'm researching, is that something I should actually take on an airplane? Or should I check it in a bag? So we all have these moves of self-surveillance that we begin to look at our own actions and what we think might be incriminating, which are otherwise just innocent actions, but have been now transformed into a state where uh, even innocent actions can be perceived as uh, particular threats if your body is one that is racialized and coded in a way um, 
that Muslims are, that are uh, naturally seen now and seen as synonymous with ideas of radicalism and terrorism. So that self-surveillance is something that many of us have adopted as a practice. It is certainly something that this 9-11 generation of Muslim youth um, are navigating in their, their world with this uh, specter of self-surveillance. So I'll just leave it there for now and happy to answer questions. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> um, so a lot of the theories that I've been looking at lately um, have to do with the state having a monopoly on violence, basically, since, you know, 16 Treaty of Australia, 1648 or whatever. Um, but then now we're entering into a new area with the rise of private military firms and all the sort of stuff where you can just contract your own army and, you know, take back your country in a matter of days. Um, do you, how do you see this transformation? How do you interpret it? Do you see this as sort of, you know, the just one more actor and, and what it means for Islamophobia in particular? I think um, one of the biggest problems is that we have a perception that there are about 180 states in the world um, as members of the UN, let's say something like that. But there's an argument to be made that if you look at the notion about the feature, the key feature of the state as being the monopoly of violence and the monopoly of legitimizing its violence, then you come to sort of very um, interesting conclusions because if you think about the greatest violence any state can inflict is really the use of nuclear weapons, then you'll find that, for example, Britain and France don't have a, a monopoly of nuclear violence simply because it's unthinkable they could use their nuclear weapons without American acquiescence or something. I mean, this is part of their integrated structures. Similarly, in intelligence fields, you can see that there are relationships which try and decompose that kind of Westphalian model to what um, Martin Shaw, uh, International Relations Scholar at the University of Sussex, calls the conglomerate state. That on issues of defense, there's what he calls the Western conglomerate state, which even though it looks like they're different national states, there's actually just one uh, conglomerate state because it has so much authority on the key issues around defense. So. Now, if you start playing with that, then the idea of the uh, military contractors, it seems to me, um, becomes slightly more complicated because in many cases, the military contractors are not independent entities in a way. They are doing the work, they're making war, permanent war possible without permanent mobilization of the population. So if you think about it, the war, the United States has been in war now since 9-11 constantly. And it's been able to do this to some extent by moving towards these contractors. But what's actually happening in many areas, the contractors are being rolled back because it's found so problematic. So I think it's, these kinds of things keep on happening. But the real issue, it seems to me, is for Islamophobia, is that you do have these different groupings and things moving together, but what you have is what they do is creating climate of opinion and, uh, and climate of practices and templates for each other, that they inform that. And for example, Hutton's work on the sort of looking at the various militarizations of how you go from policing um, in Palestine to policing in American cities to be policing in other parts of the world. So you basically have the same kind of training modules and training programs, et cetera, going around. So I think those kinds of practices there. So I think what we need to do is move away from the idea that the fiction of the nation state with your own flag and you know, sports team, et cetera, represents what a state is. And really underneath that, you have to say, well, which states are really truly sovereign? And I would say to you, it's not more than about, it's more than like a handful, or it's not 180 for sure. Yeah. Um, thank both of you. Um, both of the presentations I thought were informative and to some extent, but in your case, less provocative. So um, the first goes to you, Professor. And this um, goes to the question of surveillance and whether you believe that to be in, in and of itself. Because um, from what my own experience, 
And this is including times when I worked for like the Drug Enforcement Administration on asset forfeiture divisions, post-seizure work, and things of that sort. Whenever we surveil, uh, the end was to capture someone, even if criminally charged, we always took something. So I noticed that even with surveillance, it's not necessarily only tied to a person where they move, but it's also increasingly attached to their assets. Even when, when people who are accused of crimes um, plead guilty and plead bills are made, they normally surrender their assets. And in instances where people have been um, have left the United States doing things legitimately, um, the government, even the FBI, will come and seize their assets, along with putting them in jail. So I was wondering if the end is in and of itself to seize or to to uh, serve the help people and somehow keep them in check or self-check them, um, or whether it's tied to the taking of assets for one. And assets would include physical things of value but also rights that would otherwise be acquired, uh, acquired under a nation state status of some sort. And, and the second question goes to you. Now, you, you talk about Islamophobia, this thing being, this phenomenon being somehow orchestrated by some governance or some nation state. And I want to challenge that, part of that, for uh, a moment. So in, in, in many ways you did as well. You talked about the transnational aspect of uh, Islamophobia exceeding that of a nation state itself. But some aspect of rationale was attached to that, some rationality was attached to that. And I wonder whether that can be challenged. Like Islamophobia may, if you take a look at Europe for example, Europe has, Europeans have always fought each other from clans to, to uh, kingdoms, to neighborhoods, and it's always been an irrational kind of uh, fight that's based on people being different. And Islamophobia, to me, grows out of that as well. Uh, and, and I don't want to use you know, the obvious term to people who are Jewish, but if you take a look at the microcosm of the worst kinds of fear, they've always been uh, among those who have been messed upon the most, now who have acquired power. And that form of Islamophobia may have influenced, once acquiring power, nation states act out against Muslim subjects wherever they find them. It's sort of a um, predictable form of irrationality that, that we somehow give um, uh, the cover of governance to. So you could just address those. Sure. Um, your question regarding uh, seizure of assets, I mean, I'm not sure if, uh, I mean, maybe that's a fringe benefit to some of the kinds of surveillance that are, are taking place under the banner of, of CBE. But one way the CBE franchise has been extended is through the, um, the arm of the revenue services. Um, so in Canada, we have Canada Revenue Services, and they are now uh, looking at Muslim charities and looking at their books and are surveilling them uh, for, you know, alleged contributions they may be receiving from uh, questionable sources, things like that. So this is something that, in fact, Muslim organizations have been trying to organize around because they're all being targeted with audits. And so this is another branch, I think, of CBE or countering violent extremism where they're trying to come in and look at, in this case, charities and where they're getting their money from or where they're sending their money to. Um, you know, under the sort of Islamophobic ideologies that are out there that they're connected to, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood or some other kind of organization. And this is a kind of, um, you know, ideology that's being espoused through a lot of white nationalist, white supremacist groups. This is their basically Islamist boogeyman that they're um, mobilizing. And in fact, it looks like some of the state agencies are um, gaining, giving special attention to Muslim charities and organizations, perhaps because of some of that kind of ideology. So I know in that sense how assets are being um, surveilled as well as bodies. Um, I I want to make clear, when I talk about um, governmentality, I don't necessarily imply that there was one nation state that's spreading Islamophobia. I think the question hinges, what you're asking for, is on what do you think is rational or irrational in a way. If we mean by rationality nothing more than a certain kind of um, coherence, um, then I have no problem with it. Um, if we mean by rationality something that doesn't accord with something greater than that, a reason with a capital R, 
And I'm not a big fan of saying, well, racism is irrational or rational in that sense. Racism and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, they are coherent. Um, calling them irrational may, may make us feel better about it, but it rarely makes, does any work. It doesn't help us. You'll never convince a, a racist to stop being racist because of the logic of your propositions or saying that this is, um, you know, what you're doing is irrational because they have a, it all fits together. So I think one of the issues that I would say to you is this, that I think all forms of organizations have the skill in rationalizing their decisions. Arguing. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's what humans do. But it is the ability to present their, uh, the, their arguments as being um, rational and coherent and unaffected by passions, etc. So I don't think Islamophobia is irrational or rational, except that I don't, nor do I think that it has a particular um, roots which can be traced to the formation of Europe as contending states, etc. I think it's to me is interesting that Islamophobia appears, like I say, in elsewhere, in, in, in as a response to the appearance of the figure of the Muslim. Now, if you look at Europe, um, there were no Muslims in Britain, for example, before 1989. There weren't any Muslims in France before the headscarf affair of the early 90s. There weren't Muslims in the Netherlands uh, before the murder of Pope 14. And what I mean by that is not there weren't empirically people who were Muslims, but Muslims were not identified as a public figure. They did not have a public presence, in which case there wasn't. It was simply the populations were considered to be, um, there was people considered to be Kurds or Turks or Maghrebis or Pakistanis or Bangladeshis, but not Muslims. Now in Europe, there are all these populations have been reclassified, which again shows the whole idea of the constitutive nation of racist practices, that you now classify all of these populations as being Muslim, and you come to the conclusion that Europe has got 30, 20, 50 million Muslims in it. And suddenly people are saying, one day you're going through life, and there's only about you know, three, uh, 1 million Muslims in your country, and suddenly you're told there are 50 million Muslims in Europe. So, it, and what's happened is that you've started counting things differently. Mm -hmm. And that fear of counting produces all kinds of different kinds of results. So I would say to you that if we're gonna look for the reason of um, Islamophobia, I think it's more to do with the fact that Islamophobia appears, for example, in Europe at the same time as European integration begins to put into question the future of the nation state in Europe. And Islamophobia is a, its way of inscribing the crisis. White, the crisis of um, white supremacy is one of the ways now expressed in Europe through Islamophobia. Uh, and these are for contingent historical reasons of not great uh, pedigree, but simply they respond to certain kinds of things which are happening at that moment in time. Next question. Um, yeah. So, my question will be to both uh, all of you. Uh, so, uh, someone, uh, you're talking about generalizing context and about exact articulations that uh, Islamophobia uh, exists. And uh, so, if you see, for example, in the context, uh, for example, of uh, Eastern Europe, then uh, we can see that uh, all of that you are talking about, about these uh, racialized forms of uh, securitization that you were talking about, and uh, this artificial division into good and bad Muslims, it, uh, it really works, but this is not a uh, discovery, but Muslims agree to be part of this system. So, um, for, uh, just uh, for example, from Eastern Europe, so they, they agree because these systems are working and Muslims are ready to be divided into these good and bad ones. Of course, if they are good ones. So uh, they are ready for such, uh, for such rules. 
and uh, so they want to be involved in this system, just uh, just to be part of part of this system, so they can demonstrate loyalty to the state, uh, to this system, because it's, uh, for example, the only way to to exist for this community. So how to uh, how to deal with it, uh, with the, all of these your theoretical constructions? Well, I mean, I think this is why I was focusing on the figure of the Muslim, which is the figure of the Muslim, like any kind of figure, is completely different than whatever the reality may be. In the fig no one can be a Muslim like the figure of the Muslim. Now, in terms of being people um, internalizing some of these logics, well, in a sense, that's not surprising. Um, it happens all the time. Even, for example, during the occupation of Eastern Europe, let's say, by the Germans or by the Soviets, there were many different kinds of takes. If some Eastern Europeans completely internalized and became completely um, integrated into systems of repression, etc. Um, if you look at, for example, the files which have come out of the German Democratic Republic, East Germany, and you find the shocking thing was that there were family members who had been spying on each other. Husbands and wives spying on each other. Uh, parents spying on each other. I mean, in a pre-computer age, the amount of records that the Stasi was able to produce on the population, and even people who were often considered to be critics of the regime, it turned out, in some cases, were affiliated with the regime. So I think these kinds of positionalities in which we expect a certain kind of heroic uh, markers are really, really difficult to sustain. The history of colonialism is replete with colonized subjects who were completely, we would consider to be collaborationist with the colonial regimes. So that shouldn't be of any particular surprise to us. What is interesting, of course, is like, for example, in the case of South Africa, um, if after the ending, formal ending of apartheid, you could hardly find any Africans or any white South African who said they were in favor of the apartheid. Everyone said they were always against it. And then you wonder how the system lasted 40 years because everyone was against it. So I think these kinds of judgments and things don't tell us very much except how, how difficult it is to carry out resistance in various kinds of positionalities, that it really does require a huge mobilization, even to know what it means to resist. And the experience of racism is very good in this, because often um, people, immigrants arriving into racist um, countries, it takes them a while to pick up on the fact that this is where they're facing racism. They need to be educated into that. They start off with the assumption that why people are acting or treating them is because there's something wrong with those people or they've done something wrong and normally you sort of think you've done something wrong or you have been misunderstood and it takes you a while and you have access to other sources and other communities which tell you actually you need to wake up. The reason why the police are constantly stopping you isn't because you may be a bad driver or something, it may be because you are ethnically marked and that's why they stop you. So I think these are just common experiences, and part of them is about raising consciousness to become aware of that and minimize the number of people who simply um, become integrated into those kind of repressive systems. So can I, I'll just add to that as well. And the, the last quote that I shared was, um, you know, in the last sentence, she's talking about, you know, being on this plane and having this book about, you know, children, you know, in airplanes, and then realizing why, why did we pack this? Because again, it can be incriminating for Muslims to be, if anyone else carries it, it's not a problem. So that idea of being self-surveilling, and actually the last thing she says there is also talking about, um, you know, you have to, to sit and smile nicer, and your, your bodily comportment even needs to exude something to present to others that I'm not a threat to you. And so I think that you could say that's about playing the good Muslim, but it's also just about uh, how people navigate and survive this context of Islamophobia, because there is a collective labeling and collective guilt that's mapped onto Muslim bodies over, you know, anything anyone Muslim does. The next day, you know, kids are going to school who have the same name. You know, after 9-11, my son was named, his name Usama, 
So he had a lot of teasing and a lot of problems for years because of his name. So trying to distance yourself from a socially devalued identity is one of the strategies that people do. Um, and also with this idea of performing yourself or presenting yourself in the public sphere as I'm not a threat, I'm not what you think, uh, you know, is just a way that people actually have to cope with the, the heavily inscribed, um, you know, uh, racial uh, connotations that their identity has, seen, has become uh, connected with. And so there is a kind of more purposeful good Muslim, bad Muslim sort of play, especially with a lot of these organizations, for example, who, you know, uh, don't want to be seen, like they don't want to lose funding, they don't want, you know, they don't want to be seen because as being a uh, bad Muslim in a certain way because there's stakes attached to that. So it's not so much that, um, that they want to participate in this, but that there's not necessarily a choice because the terms of engagement are there and people need to navigate within them and they do that strategically, you know, in different ways. So that's in some ways how the good Muslim, bad Muslim idea gets sort of played out or how people uh, engage with that uh, is a way of sometimes self-preservation because you don't have the luxury of being an individual if you're from a racialized background because what one person does gets mapped onto everyone. You have to bear that collective guilt. So sometimes you make these moves just to sort of um, work against that particular stereotype. So, um, thank you very much for your uh, presentation of geopolitics of uh, you know, which I think, you know, conceptually really uh, questions or also us to rethink some of our understanding of Islamophobia. Just wondering though whether um, there's a need for uh, the conception to be slightly nuanced, simply because I think the state itself does not necessarily uh, see Muslims uh, as a threat to you know, their, their sort of nation building project uh, to that end goal. Uh, because the example you gave, for, for instance, of China, uh, the, Chinese, the Chinese state targets the Uyghurs, uh, the Kazans, uh, uh, you know, generally people who are in, in the Xinjiang uh, province. Uh, but you also have another group of Muslims, the Hindu Muslims, who uh, have generally been untouched by the state, in fact, have enjoyed uh, privileges of, of the state. So I'm wondering whether there are aspects of that Muslimness, uh, and it's very contextualized to different states, uh, that, both, that is deemed as a threat. So it's not just about the Muslim, but certain of, about Muslimness per se, but specific aspects of Muslimness in specific contexts uh, that is deemed as a threat, uh, and thus needs to be dealt with uh, you know, in a particular way. And I think that, perhaps uh, also relates to the point that she might have made about Eastern Europe. Uh, it's not just about the notion of the good Muslim or the bad Muslim, but how uh, people have grown to see themselves over a period of time because of communist rule and the way they, they see themselves within uh, that setting. And they themselves might actually exhibit certain uh, behavior that might be deemed as Islamophobic, uh, even if they are from uh, Muslim backgrounds. So, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with that in, well, apart from the bit about being more nuanced, because I mean, I, I think that it comes down to what does Muslimness mean? And as you imply, what Muslimness means depends on um, specific contexts. But it has a certain uh, family resemblance with other forms of Muslimness. And you maybe take, for example, India, and you could say that there is a distinction, or there used to be a distinction, about the Muslims in Kashmir and the Muslims elsewhere. And what you've seen in the last uh, few years under Modi is that distinction is beginning to collapse. So in a sense, the similar thing could possibly be the case. Now, in nearly every single case, Muslimness is already aligned with the idea of someone which is not part of a national community or whatever that may be the case. So even in the case when you say you fix on the Uyghurs, and the idea that the Uyghurs are secessionists. Now, the idea of Muslim secessionists is actually considered to be quite common, even in places where, for example, it's almost impossible. So if you look at the <coughs> metropolitan um, centers of Europe, where most of the Muslims live, no one really suggests, except in their kind of fantasies, that these are kind of Islamic republics being formed in the suburbs of Paris or um, you know, 
or, or, or um, Rotterdam or, or, or Bradford or wherever. But the idea that somehow these are distinct and they are not part, and I think that there's a certain foreignness which is attached to the Muslimness in all of these cases. And that foreignness, I would say to you, is not just temp uh, spatial, but also temporal. So in the sense I don't disagree with you, but I think the Muslimness, in a sense, cannot be reduced to a dictionary definition of what is Muslimness. It will change around time, but a lot of it is about being at the limit of what the society can cope with or what the society's frontiers are. Thank you both very much. Uh, just a quick question. I sense the past couple of days, especially with Professor Matthias' uh, uh, um, presentation yesterday on self surveillance. And um, one question is how, what, walking away from this, how do we almost liberate or save our community from the sense of self surveillance uh, before they sleepwalk into the Stockholm syndrome when they feel almost like I've been abused, the state is doing this to me, I have to accept it and just deal with it and almost have this ongoing process in our mind to think, well, this is the reality. Um, because we're not, we don't have the privilege to have, not have these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that perhaps actually feeds into the sort of good versus bad Muslim narrative in the sense that you will get some institutions who will buy into CBE and prevent and actually further the whole concept of um, we are defending the abuser, almost, uh, in terms of the community that um, will be targeted through these such, such, such policies. Let's take three questions, because we have 10 minutes left. So, okay. mm, this is perhaps a little bit related to that. Thank you both for excellent presentations. I was thinking about your definition of, of Islamophobia as uh, form of racism and that target certain expressions of Muslimness. And, and maybe this, this is very kinky, but I think that that sort of misses out to the point that Islamophobia is independent of whatever Muslims do or can express or articulate. So maybe it's more, you know, it's better to talk about that, that Islamophobia as a sort of form of racism that construe uh, Muslimness for certain articulations of Muslimness. That said, though, I was also thinking, and I'm taken aback by what you said, Jasmine. Uh, also in Sweden, you know, there's so many Muslims that cannot remember the time or conceive of the time um, <coughs> that's not, in which the camp not is the reality, in which the tournament not is the only reality, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the possibilities for collective resistance. and. Connecting that to Salman's first uh, notion of students disrupting the university, <laughs> uh, people disrupting government mentality and the, the, the management of populations by the state. I think also that, that um, Muslims disturb Islamophobia. If you look at, at the opinion polls, Islamophobia is more popular uh, in, in places where there are no <coughs> Muslim people. Uh, so, so maybe being Muslim might be a way of disturbing anti-Muslim <laughs> races and that cuts things up and, 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 and might actually accomplish, and of course if the power is multiplied in this way, the possibilities for assistance needs to be multiplied uh, enormously. And, and if you could reflect something about the, the possibilities of using that as a political agency for establishing a sort of collective resistance to what's happening in, from the perspective of, of the 9-11 generation. I think the idea of um, well, Islamicization as a cure for Islamophobia has a certain attraction for some Muslims, but I think it would just make the Islamophobes even more blow explode their heads. Because that's what they said their entire plan about Islamophobia is that. But I can see the charm of that proposition. Sorry. Um, I wanted to thank you, of course, for presenting such difficult concepts in such a comprehensive way. Um, and then I wanted to mention you emphasized the role of state in so to speak indoctrination. Um, of associating or Islamophobia being the cause of like war and terror and then with everything that's going on in the world right now you can certainly actually 
make an observation that there has been um, uh, the war on terror is really the war on Islam and Muslims because uh, the association of radicalization and terrorism with being Muslim um, falling over into, for example, us not necessarily accepting the fact that we are self-surveilling, but we certainly are. Because as a Muslim, I can tell you, I certainly watch the way I walk or what I say about certain statements I make. So uh, considering such a power, if uh, that notion of like associating terrorism and radicalization with Islam is indoctrinated by the state itself that holds the power at, over, over media, over policy making, um, and uh, considering that we have put ourselves in a bind as Muslims, we actually watch every single step we take, how do we break that chain as the next generation um, to battle and then perhaps bring some change for the generation that comes after us? So my question is something kind of such a, uh, in a way, of reformulating the, the title of your, your paper. That's right. You were saying that the geopolitics of Islamophobia and listening to the content of the presentation, I feel that the, the formulation can also be shifted to uh, the political scale of Islamophobia, given the, your own presentations that throughout the history, in time and space, the content and the strategies remain the same. And so, given that kind of a descriptions and presentation, still using the geopolitical formulation of Islamophobia uh, would be insufficient, I think, uh, to capture the, the, the deeper and underlying uh, practice of Islam, Islamophobia. So in that sense, the terminology of uh, what do you feel uh, introducing the term of political scape of Islamophobia uh, in the place of geopolitical Islamophobia. Scape means the movement of ideas and in terms of content and product and strategies. So what do you think in that sense? Last question. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Um, the first question that I have concerns the use of state of exception. Um, now I understand the context of the West uh, with human rights having been guarded for a fair bit of time until perhaps recently. But in the non-West, it's the state of exception has, has existed for a long, long time, right? In many cases, those rights never existed in the first place. So what was there an exception from? So with that in mind, would it make more sense to look at something like, say, the Uyghur case in China, more in the context of nation building itself, right? Because uh, this goes back to a point that you made earlier as well about how secession, you are doubting, you're, you're sort of saying that Muslimness has been equated with secessionism, right? But in the case of China, there are many secessionist movements historically. Uh, Tibet has been accused of that, Taiwan has been accused of that. So would it not make more sense to look at it in that sort of context as well? Okay, um, I think the three questions here, which really were about how to deal with Islamophobia, and while I have great sympathies with Matthias' suggestion about being Muslim as a cure for Islamophobia, I think there is an element of truth in that as well, and it's not just related to Islamophobia. If you'll notice that um, in surveys after surveys, racism is m the most intense in places where there are no ethnic minorities, for example. It's actually repeated again and again. Racist <coughs> violence occurs per capita more in places where there are no, um, and which goes to show back the idea that we're looking at really is the figure of the Muslim rather than the empirical fact. And so I completely agree with that. So I think the real solution to all of those things you're saying is the, uh, it's a very kind of um, bland one in the end. The only way you can deal with this is politicization and political mobilization. And unless you can raise consciousness in terms, and I don't mean that in a, just in a very kind of, um, peripheral sense, but I do mean political mobilization is the only way which you can end Islamophobia. Because part of that is to recognize Islamophobia is not about, um, it's not inherent, it's not about culture, it is about a particular kind of configuration. 
And so part of that would be to have the struggle. And for all its weaknesses and all its disappointments, the two main challenges thus far to white supremacy have been the anti-racist civil rights struggle in the United States and the anti-colonial struggles throughout the world. And even despite, and these were ultimately, were what they depended on in all cases was the mobilization of the population to become so disruptive that it required transformations and things like that. So learning how to be disruptive is actually a very difficult challenge, but that's the only way that one can do it. You know? So that's the first kind of solution. The questions around the um, geopolitical formulation, the whole point of what I was trying to say is this, that in a way you can't have a geopolitical formulation of Islamophobia precisely because the classical understandings of geopolitics do not take into account something like Islamophobia. So they are erasure of that. But if you wanted to talk about geopolitics in a way in which you're talking about the organization of space and the kind of order of the world, then Islamophobia has a constitutive role. This is against the positions which think of Islamophobia as epiphenomenal or as simply an excuse or a cover for the working out of the logic of capital or working out the, um, uh, some kind of um, crisis in, in, in the financial markets or certain kind of, those sorts of arguments, right? So in that sense, I don't, um, for me, it is about renegotiating and understanding Islamophobia at the global level, but not at the global level simply in terms of the commonalities of its trading, but in the way that it's constituting the globe itself, claiming the very idea of what globality is. So I think that's the point I would say. Um, the question about the state of exception, and I know you guys don't pick up on this, but you have to understand the state of exception it was part of the colonial order. All colonial states were states of exception. And as a consequence, the, what they were, in fact, you could argue that in the idea that there was no human rights, etc., is one way true, but also particularly not particularly helpful. So you could take the position that someone like Richard Bulliard takes, um, and others like him, that for example, in areas of Muslim rule, that up till about the 1800s, you basically had the operation of an independent judicial order which gave a degree of insulation to the arbitrary exercise of authority and power um, through, for example, the mechanism of Sharia, etc. So a state of exception has been the breakdown of that configuration of state. And you could see that in different places as well, that the colonial order itself introduced the state of exception to the society in both its biopolitical sense but also in a rhetorical sense. So in the idea that why, yes, of course, China talks about succession about Tibet, and it talks about succession in relation to Taiwan. But what is interesting is the fact that it focuses on not the Uyghurs as simply a, success, uh, a minority that wishes to succeed from the People's Republic, but it focuses on their Muslimness. That's why, for example, you have reports of being forced to drink or being um, their idea of um, removing certain kinds of markers of Muslimness. You could easily have the argue, uh, um, a attack on the Uyghurs as a group which wishes to succeed from the People's Republic without having to go through the contours and labyrinths of their Muslimness as being what needs to be corrected. So I think that's where the challenge really comes into it. Again, what I would say about racism and Islamophobia, it doesn't mean that there's no other evil in the world and nothing else is happening there. It just means it's quite interesting to see how this form of cruelty is becoming um, global and institutionalized globally. That doesn't mean there aren't other forms of cruelty. Um, I don't have a lot to add, but I'll just say that for me, when I look at Islamophobia, and I, I, I take the point, I think it's an important one, that you can have Islamophobia without the presence of Muslims. Similarly, when people say, you know, um, talk about um, racism, well, I, you know, I'm not racist, has very little to do with, with people's intentions. Racism isn't about intentions, people's good intentions. It operates as a system of oppression. 
and it has in, in systemic manifestations through which it becomes reproduced. So I see Islamophobia in, this, in the same way in that it is a system of oppression. Um, and I'm interested in the dynamics of it in terms of its individual manifestations as kind of the tip of the iceberg, what we see, individual actions, name calling, vandalism, so on. But below the surface of the water is what we don't see, and those are the ideologies that sustain and rationalize and justify those actions, and the systemic practices through which it becomes reproduced. So in that formulation, Islamophobia as a system of domination, as a system of power and oppression, of, of course it's not, you know, the question of rationality or is it irrational, uh, of course not. That creates a space of innocence. There is a logic and rationality to systems of power, right, upon which they operate. So it isn't about creating an alibi and a space of innocence for uh, state practices or others just to say that this is irrational. No, there's a logic and rationality to systems of dominance. And this is where what, for me, Islamophobia is, is the system of power and oppression. Um, and so, of course, it happens above and beyond intentions. It happens where Muslims are not present. Uh, and I think it's important to keep Islam in Islamophobia. So as much as we talk about Muslimness, and I think that's obviously important uh, in the way that Salman has um, defined it, but it also, what is it about Muslims that is significant or common? And that is the adherence to Islam. And if you look at a lot of the rhetoric um, and discourses that come out of Islamophobic uh, entities, right? It's always about demonizing Islam. So anti-Muslim racism relies upon the demonization of Islam. There's nothing particularly interesting about Muslims otherwise uh, than that relationship and that connection. So Islamophobia also has a longer history and genealogy than starting on September 12th, right? It goes back, uh, to me it predates uh, racism in terms of we look at race evolving in the modern period, Islamophobia for me goes back to, you know, first Muslim communities uh, that were persecuted or the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him himself, who was persecuted. To me, I see those as acts of Islamophobia as well and that predates modern forms of racism. So I think that um, it has a longer history and genealogy. It's a good way to think about it in terms of the processes through which racism operates is similar in the way that Islamophobia operates, but it does, for me, have that longer history and that we need to keep that connection to the fact that it is about the vilification and demonization of Islam. It's the Sharia creep. It's about, you know, Muslim uh, Islamic practices um, and uh, so on that are part of this discourse and ideology of anti-Muslim racism, of Islamophobia, that are always connected back to that. Um, so I think that's also important to keep in mind. And then I guess the end of it is sort of what do we do about all of this and what is it about youth that are growing up uh, and young people growing up as part of the 9-11 generation. Um, you know, what I've discovered around that is that you, young people are politicized at a very young age. They're very cognizant of um, their surroundings, of how they need to their bodily comportment, what they need to say, or when they're at the airport. They're all very aware of this at a, at a fairly young age. So if you're being socialized into uh, this particular climate, and they navigate within it, and they don't know a world before. So this is why, in my study, will say 9-11 didn't affect me, and yet go on and talk about all the ways that they are self-surveilling, uh, because they don't know a world before it. In terms of how do we change that, I don't, I don't know, actually. Um, I, I do agree that it is about how do we advance an effort to, to challenge this is about political mobilization, but I also see it in multiple forms because I think that, you know, as much as we talk about uh, this dynamic of Islamophobia involving ideologies and systems, we need to operate on all of those levels as well. So for me, culture, the arts, all of that is part of the transformation of imagining alternative futures, and I'm very excited about the role of Muslim youth and artists who are engaging in that and trying to imagine alternative futures because that narrative has to be challenged and reclaimed and, and put out there's the discursive basis for a lot of this. Um, so I think it's like the war of position. I think that there's many fronts. There's education, there's uh, media, there's, you know, uh, and Islamophobia is in, in all aspects. I know uh, IRDP is coming out with uh, gaming and looking at Islamophobia in gaming. You can find it in children's literature. You can find it everywhere. And so our efforts also have to be on all of those fronts and use all of those tools uh, in the arsenal to, to try and combat Islamophobia. Thank you.
see everyone tomorrow. Bye,